little bit about pendulums and what they are and how we can use them and why should we should even care. So first of all, what's a pendulum? Well, a pendulum is going to be some kind of weight suspended by a string or massless rod, something like this, that we're going to displace from where it would naturally hang and let it swing. In fact, that's where the word pendulum comes from, uh, from the Latin to hang. So, what properties does a pendulum have? Well, a pendulum is going to have the mass, the mass of this blob on the end of the string, or often called the pendulum bob. And then it's going to have a length of this string, which we can call L. And it's going to have some value that we displace it from its initial position, theta, where it likes to hang due to the force of gravity. And we can mathematically describe things about this pendulum based on these properties. Like, let's say we want to know the period of the pendulum, and the period is how long it takes for it to complete one swing, one cycle. We can describe the period by the period equals 2 pi times the square root of the length of the string over g, the force of gravity. Now, if you'll notice, mass is nowhere in this equation. That means that it's independent of the mass of this bob. You could have a block of lead there that weighs 100 pounds, and you could have a piece of cork there that weighs 1 pound. And as long as you assume that there's no other factors, such as drag or friction, they will have the same period as long as they're on the same length of string. So what could change the period? Well, we've got length of the string and gravity in here. So a pendulum would have a different period on Mars than it would on Earth, or on the Moon than it would on Earth. And you've got to make a few assumptions for this to work. You know, you've got to assume that you're dealing with an ideal system, in other words, a system that has no friction. Uh, so this pivot up here has to be frictionless. There has to be no air resistance. You have to have an ideal massless string, uh, get rid of inertial forces and that kind of thing on the string. But we can approximate it pretty well. And in fact, this only holds for an assumption. So you can even say that this is just the period is approximated by, because the assumption is that this angle theta must be very, very small. If that angle's not very small, other factors come into play that we have to account for, but we can assume that for most of our cases. Okay, so one other thing that we need to look at is the amplitude of a pendulum, or how far it's displaced from its equilibrium position. Now, that wasn't in our equation for the period of a pendulum. That means that it's amplitude independent as well as mass independent. So that makes pendulums an ideal candidate for one thing, clock making, timekeeping, which is what Galileo worked with them. He worked with them back in about 1602. He got interested when he saw a, a chandelier swinging in a church. And of course he was a genius and he says, I think I can use that for timekeeping. And a few years later he came up with a very good solution. Granted, pendulums have been approved for absolutely just centuries, but the idea started back in the 1600s, and in fact, pendulums have been around since the first century. They were used in an early seismometer to detect earthquakes. That's how useful they are. They apply in our everyday lives. Alright, so here I've got a pendulum. It's just a ball on the end of a string. And we're going to give this string some initial length. I'm going to displace it and let it swing. So you can see about what the period was. In fact, let's do it up to our pendulum here on the board. We displace it and we let it swing. Okay, now, what's going to happen if I take this length and increase it? Well, if you remember that the period of the pendulum was 2 pi times the square root of L over G. The length is in the numerator, so our period should get longer, right? Well, let's see. It's taking quite a bit longer to complete one cycle. Now, let's shorten the string. I'm going to grab it in the middle, and the period should become quicker. So, see how that sped up? Okay, we'll do it again with a little bit more dramatic example. So here, we've got period one. We're going to shorten it. And there we've got period two, much, much faster, governed by that simple equation. Granted, we're moving the pendulum quite a bit, which is where the errors and clocks would come in and why clocks don't keep perfect time, the pendulum clocks, but it's a pretty good approximation and it especially works for what we're doing. Alright, so finally we know that mass shouldn't factor in to the period of a pendulum, right? Because there's no mass in the equation. 
So here I've got two different pendulums. One of a tennis ball, one of a ping pong ball. This one obviously weighing much less. I'm going to pull them back and release them. As you see, they swing together. They swing with the same period because it's mass independent. The only thing affecting these and making the period slightly different is air resistance. So really, there you have it. Those are the basic assumptions we need to make about pendulums to be able to predict their period and use them in clocks to predict time. I hope you found this helpful, and I hope to also continue this series with more explorations into basic physics. Thank you for watching.